Hi everyone, Dr. Lee here from Your Vet Online, and tonight we're going to be talking all about dog scooting. So, how often do we actually laugh when we hear that a dog is scooting? And it can be hilarious when we see it, and we often are quite embarrassed. But what really is going on and how can we actually prevent this from happening? Because when we start to understand a little bit more about it, we actually know that scooting is not necessarily the most healthiest um, for, thing that's happening to our dog because there actually could be something wrong with them. Yes, so we're, if you're joining us tonight, write down your questions and so that I can go through and answer them as we go. Um, we're gonna be talking all about dog scooting, what are some of the common things that cause it, and also, most importantly, what you can do at home to manage this problem. Um, often it's not something we can necessarily fix, um, because it really does depend on what's causing it, but we can definitely manage it. So if you're joining us for the first time tonight, I'm Dr. Lee, I'm the founder of Your Vet Online. Now Your Vet Online is a 24 hour veterinary online veterinary service that means that you can get advice about your cats, dogs, horses, pocket pets, farm animals at any of hour of the day or night. So we have vets available whenever you need us. So um, yeah, we don't we don't have any problems answering any of your questions. And if the situation arises, we can also prescribe. So we do have some limitations on what we can prescribe for, but um, if we will definitely let you know if um, we can or we can't. Why do dogs scoot? I guess most of you are probably thinking that um, typically the first things that spring to mind are things like anal gland disease and things like parasites. Well, yeah, that can definitely be some of the reasons for scooting. And um, but there's a few. There's actually a few other reasons why. And sometimes it can actually be a, co a multiple problems that can cause scooting. So it isn't necessarily just anal glands that might be the problem. So tail fold problems are often um, an issue and so we actually lump that all together sort of in the whole skin fold um, category. As we said before, parasites possibly could be an issue. Problems with diarrhea or just loose feces. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but yes, that can cause dogs to scoot, especially if they're getting a little bit stuck on their behind. So we'll cover that too. And then the other one is allergies. So allergies can be actually cause some of the other problems so problems with the tail folds and problems with the anal glands so it sort of like it can be an overriding problem as well but let's start with anal gland disease now if you don't know what an anal gland is basically they are a scent gland and i've got a beautiful picture here which i'm going to show you let me see here and this is where we find them. So here's a picture of a dog's bottom and you can see the anus there is in the middle. Now where I've put those two little orange dots, that's where the anal glands are positioned. So we sort of say that they're around the, um, what would you say, the four o'clock and the eight o'clock region. So, that if we're looking at that, or we'll, we'll go back to that a little bit later once we um, start talking about how we can treat these at home. But basically, these scent glands provide, or they make, they produce a fishy, oily smelling secretion, and that's used to mark territory. So when the dog poops, as the feces passes through the area which is just by the external, into between the internal and external sphincters of the anus, the actual, it squeezes this gland and some of that oily smelly substance is deposited on the feces and of course that goes onto the ground. And so it acts a little bit like a, it's like a territory marker. So we all know that a dog cocks its leg to pee on the tree to 
leave its scent. We know that cats rub up against um, legs with their bottom and that sort of thing. So it's very, very similar. So it's basically their scent gland. Now the normal size is about the size of a pea or the end of your little finger. And that's how big um, a normal scent gland is. Now, an anal gland is. Of course, you're gonna have proportionally bigger anal glands in a bigger dog. So if you've got a Great Dane, of course they're gonna be a little bit bigger than the Chihuahuas. But generally speaking, if the, a normal scent gland is about the size of a pea. If they get blocked, like so there's a little tiny slit and that lets all the goo, you know, this fishy smelling horrible stuff out. But if they get blocked, then they can actually start to swell up and get a lot bigger. And when this happens, it just makes a little bit of discomfort. And that's when you start to see the dogs scooting. And you might see them, um, some dogs will be chase their tails, some will start licking at their bottoms more than normal. And yeah, basically it's, it's because these glands are starting to cause a problem. Some of the reasons why we might have problems with um, our dogs anal, well, our dogs might have problems with their anal glands, are that there could be excessive production of the actual gland fluid. They sometimes it can be due to poor muscle control um, of those actual sphincters because if they're not working properly occasionally well then the actual gland is unable to be squeezed out and so it will start to um, fill up with more um, of this fluid. Other times we might have dogs that are very obese and this seems to cause problems too. So we do see this problem in dogs that are holding a little bit too much weight. So that's just another thing to think about if your dog's a little bit on the porky side and he's having problems with his anal glands. So when these anal glands start to get what we call impacted and they start to fill up a lot, it does cause a lot of uh, discomfort for your dog. And sometimes if they're not released, then the, the fluid inside actually becomes really thick, quite gooey and, well actually it can be really, really thick actually. It's really quite disgusting. And our dogs will then become, the actual scent gland itself, the whole gland can actually become what we call um, an, it, inflammatory. So it's, it's what we call anal gland sacculitis. And so with this whole reaction, you know, it can be quite painful. Like we all know that any sort of inflammation is painful. And so that's why some of these dogs get quite um, rough licking and biting at that area. And some dogs will actually chase their tail and really do want to mutilate themselves in that area, which is not very nice for anyone. If we leave these and this inflame, inflammation increases and then the gland, because it is quite yucky, can become infected, you know, bacteria can enter and they can become infected and all the licking and carrying on that's going on, sometimes these glands will actually cause nast, an, a nasty abscess. If that happens, I haven't got a picture unfortunately and it's one of those things where you know, we do actually see these quite often and I can't believe I don't have a picture of this. So it's a little bit disappointing for you guys. Sorry about that, but I'm going to have to find a picture for you because it is important to know. But if you get start to see lumps in this area and it's starting to bulge and your dog is very sore and doesn't want you to look at that area, then you have most likely got an abscess forming and you most definitely need to see um, your veterinarian for that because it will need to be um, they will need to have a little bit of sedation, um, depend, well actually it depends on how bad the problem is because sometimes we actually need to put them under a full GA, general anaesthetic, but sometimes we just need a little bit of sedation or if they're very, very ripe, we might be able to just lance it quickly and get rid of that, um, that nasty abscess and then we can flush them out and treat them. It can be really, really painful. So. If those impacted glands do start to get, and we, we don't do anything about it, and you've seen your dog scooting a lot, you really do need to get um, learn how to um, squeeze those anal glands yourself, or you can actually get 
um, you take them to your vet or you might have a groomer that does it or a dog sitter that might be able to do it for you because we really don't want these glands to get into the situation where they do become um, infected and you end up getting a uh, nasty abscess because that just ends up costing you money and causing a lot of pain for your dog. Um, oh, actually, I was going to mention too some of the techniques that we use if you want to try and do these at home to release these at home. Um, it is quite difficult and what I recommend is that you make sure you've got gloves for your hands because <laughs> it's pretty yucky. You do not want to get the stuff on your fingers and also keep your mouth closed because for some sometimes you actually end up <laughs> squirting it where it shouldn't be squirted, which is really disgusting. There's often jokes with many a vet or vet nurse where we've accidentally either squirted an owner or squirted ourselves in the face. So it can be quite disgusting. But what we recommend is that there's two ways of doing it. You can either do it externally or you can do it internally. If you're doing it externally, that means you're just basically putting your fingers, I'll bring up this picture again, you're putting your fingers on the outside of the anus at four o'clock and at eight o'clock and you are basically where those orange dots are and you're squeezing the the two sides together with your um, with your finger and your thumb now I don't tend to have too much luck with that method um, yeah I'm I must admit I'm more of an internal um, operator so if we're going to do it internally what we end up doing is we get our finger and we put it into the anus and you reach down with your finger onto where the four o'clock or the eight o'clock and you use your thumb I'm trying to get this in the screen here you get your thumb to squeeze so you've got your thumb on the outside of the dog got your finger inside the rectum and you find your little um, bean of your scent gland and then you just apply pressure and the idea is that you apply firm pressure with the sort of like the ballish bit of your finger and you just hold that on your two fingers together like so until you find that it will slowly you just keep that pressure on keep that pressure on and the next minute it will usually just start to ooze out and make sure that when you're doing it you actually hold I don't actually have any with me you hold your um, at the same time you have a whole heap of uh, paper towels or cotton wool or whatever just hold that up at the same time so you're squeezing it and you're covering so you can collect all that yuckiness because it is foul and um, yeah, you don't want to get that anywhere near you definitely not on your face and oops and definitely definitely not on your face and definitely not on your hands so please make sure you wear you wear gloves with this it is disgusting righty ho now let's just have a quick talk about how we can um how to prevent them so I, of course we can squeeze them that is the um that that's the way of getting rid of them but let's Oh, actually, I'm just going to talk about something else first because this will help later. So we'll just go and talk about our skin fold problem. Now, so skin folds, we, we often see skin folds in any of those dogs that have a lot of loose skin. So it could be like our brachycephalic breeds, you know, with a French bulldog, um, the, the English bulldog. Uh, you've got bloodhounds that can get it. Any of those sort of breeds, Sharpay, that sort of thing. Anything with wrinkles is prone to a skin fold problem. And although they often have it around their face and around their nose, a lot of these dogs also get it around their tail. So, um, and they might have that big lump over the top of their tail. And then also some of these dogs, especially the English Bulldog, will have what we call as a corkscrew tail. And so when think these areas are quite moist and they're like a big wrinkle and of course it just traps moisture and it's the perfect breeding ground for bacteria and all that 
you know, yuckiness. Now, every dog has bacteria on their skin. We've even got bacteria on our skin. It's not unusual for that to happen. But as soon as you get moisture, and then, um, then of course that skin barrier can weaken, dogs will often then start to gnaw at themselves. And as soon as they start doing that, the risk of actually um, having a small penetration of the skin or even the raspiness on their tongue can lift that layer of outer skin so that they actually, um, bacteria is able to get in and then start to multiply and then they get inf inflammation. So we basically call these skin fold pyodermas or skin fold dermatitis. And if you own one of these breeds of dogs and you've got all these wrinkles, then you, you are, you're going to have to be um, pretty much um, cleaning these, these skin folds daily. It's a daily job for you. And it's one of the jobs that you need to do for any dog that's got this problem because if you miss a day or two, sometimes things can really, really flare up quite quickly. You'll often get a hint that there's something brewing when you start to see a sort of an orangey brown color. And you may even get a bit of a stench and, and that means that something's happening. So you do need to clean these daily. We've actually got a, um, I'll put a link up afterwards for a article that I've written and we've actually got some, you can download some ideas and what well, instructions on how to deal with what these are, these sort of hot spot type areas. The same goes for treatment goes for hot spots versus skin fold pyodermas versus skin fold dermatitis, anything like that. It's all sort of basically the same thing, but we like to use topical um, antiseptics and we tend to use those first. And the other big thing is to keep these areas really dry. So if you're gonna wipe them, you wipe it and then you dry it off nicely so that they don't um, keep getting, keeping that moisture in that spot. Scooting caused by parasites. Now, heaps of people always think like there's, um, you know, parasites can cause, um, you know, it's cause them to scoot. Here's a lovely picture for you. Um, you might like that. Probably not. It's pretty disgusting. You know, that's a picture of some roundworms. Um, and often if you've got a younger dog, because particularly puppies or dogs that have not had their proper worming schedules, worms can be hanging out of their bottom and it's just, it's not so much a inflammatory problem, it's more of a fact that it's just irritating. So if a dog starts to, um, especially puppies when they're very young, they will often start to scoot and that's probably due for worming because we do know that with pups, they get worms from their mother, and honestly, there's that many worms in their system that it can take quite some time before you, and a lot of different, a lot of treatments, remember with puppies, we treat for roundworms every two weeks. So it can take a long time to get rid of the burden of worms that they actually have. And it's no reflection on dirtiness in, a, in your property or anything like that. It's just a fact of life. I guess the other thing that can cause like another reason for parasites causing scooting is if your dog has got a flea allergy um, something like that or you've got lots of fleas and got ticks and that sort of thing well they'll scratch their bottom because they're itchy and also let's not forget when we talk about skin fold dermatitis there can be some occasions where you actually have a problem with mites as well not very common However, I have to say, just to be complete, that that can be an issue too. So the best thing about parasite type issues is that it's really easy to um, take, um, be prevent, prevent this as a cause of scooting because basically you just keep your dog up to date with their worming and their flea and tick control and then you're not gonna get these problems. Another big problem that we sometimes see is scooting that's actually caused by feces. And you probably think that's a bit of a weird thing for me to say and all that, but you'll be surprised at how many people actually bring their pet to the 
uh, vet and say to us, oh, there's something wrong with his bottom, he's having a terrible time. And when we actually look down that end, what we see is that there's a lot of feces that's caught up in the hair and it's stuck and think, and it's dried and it's like concrete and it can make it really painful and really uncomfortable for the dog. So if your dog has um, is a, got long hair in that area, it could be a schnauzer, could be a, oh, I think I've actually got a photo of one here. What have we got here? This little guy, you know, looking a fluffy bum like this one. Then it's always a good idea to trim around their bottom so that they can actually, um, you know, so the, the feces isn't getting caught. Now, I know whenever I have a dog and at the hospital and they've got diarrhea, I will usually trim up their bottom because I just can't stand diarrhea and I can't stand it going everywhere. So if I've got a dog that's, you know, I tend to clip bottoms unless they're a short haired dog anyway, because I just don't like the thought of them carrying any feces around because it can happen even if you do keep them trimmed. So, I always do that. Now, the other thing to do with um, some dogs sometimes have a problem with their feces and it's just a little bit too sloppy. And again, remember we said back right at the beginning about um, when we're talking about anal glands that a bulky feces is going to help squeeze those anal glands. Now, bulky feces is also going to be better so that they don't actually get it all through their coat. So one of the ways to to increase the bulk in your feces is actually to feed a really high quality kibble. So any of the brands like Hill Science Diet, Royal Cannon, Yukonuba Pro Plan, those types of diets are very good and they have a good bulky feces. So there's big feces and not too much of it um, and then whereas some of the cheaper brands um, and things like dog roll and all that sort of stuff they don't they tend to just produce a lot of poop and often it's not very well formed and it doesn't have a lot of bulk to it so that it actually doesn't come out in a, a good way so that it actually squeezes those anal glands now the other thing that you can do is if you don't feed a kibble or you want to add other um, things to your pet's diet, you might think of supplementing with vegetables such as carrots, broccoli and pumpkin. Now these are really good to bulk up a diet, um, yeah, bulk up a food, a diet, and they will help uh, make those feces a lot bigger too. The other one that I love, and I feed this, well, everybody actually can take this, humans as well as animals. It's the best stuff ever, and that's the psyllium husk. It's super cheap. A lot of people will buy um, Metamucil, but that's a very expensive version. Um, psyllium husk can just be bought as a cheapie um, from the supermarket. I mean, I think that's like three dollars. So and I, we're in Australian dollars here, but it's, it's not very expensive. And I give that about one tablespoon every oh, every couple of days or so, till every two or three days. It's not something I feed every day, and I don't feed it every day to myself. I don't feed it every day to my pets. But what it does, it does bulk out the feces. It helps this high fiber helps remember it helps with gut health it's a um, it's a type of probiotic and uh, prebiotic sorry and so it actually helps with gut health and yeah it's an overall a little bit like a wonder wonder food I suppose I don't know why it doesn't quite get the um, the the platitudes that it should because it's actually really 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 good for you and good for your pets um, I really love it the next little thing we're going to talk about that's the potential cause of scooting is allergies. So everything that we've talked about so far could have allergies as the 
the root cause, you know, like so it could be an anal gland problem, but the actual main cause is an allergy. It could be skin fold problems and the main cause is not necessarily, well, they've got a skin fold issue, but it's exacerbated by an allergy. We talked about parasites, maybe they've got flea dermatitis, flea allergies, and that some of these dogs, they just need one flea and that's all it takes and they just rip them to themselves. So allergies, you know, they could be an environmental allergy, it could be a food allergy, it could be ATP, which is just a what, what is causing the problem type allergy, <laughs> parasitic allergies, and of course you've got other allergies like drug allergies and things like that, but that's not really generally the cause of this sort of thing. But as I said before, a lot of the problems that we mentioned earlier can be directly related to allergies. Now, we're pretty lucky these days. We've got some wonderful treatments and medications available to help manage allergies. So if you're struggling with your, your dog, they're really, you know, we really don't need to totally depend on those nuts you know, like the prednisone that we used to use all the time. We can start to use some of the other medications and things. It's really important that we get to the bottom of it though. I see a lot of people jumping immediately to thinking that their dog has a food allergy. Food allergies are nowhere near as prevalent as um, environmental allergies and the vast majority of food allergies occur when a dog is quite young. So we start to see this when they're very young and they're still within the first year of age. So some of these older dogs, I'm not convinced that owners have got it right and they think that, that their dog's got a food allergy. And things like grains are not, they're not the big causes of food allergies. That's all a little bit of a, a, a marketing fallacy. Somebody's put that out there that, you know, dogs shouldn't have grains and it causes all these allergies. And quite frankly, it couldn't, nothing could be further from the truth. Regardless of the cause, some of these dogs become quite um, itchy all over. They do start to scratch so much and they scoot around the ground. So it's always a good idea to have that at the back of your mind. And if, you're, if you've ruled out that they don't have problems with their anal glands, they're up to date with all their flea and flea tick and worming protocols, then you most likely, and they don't have tail fold issues or anything like that, then you're very likely to have an allergy problem and we need to get onto that because sometimes these dogs, you know, they can really do themselves some, um, some damage with all of this. So that basically takes us to the, to what we're sort of saying. It's totally preventable in a lot of um, reason, you know, like for a lot of these things. So we have to keep our parasite control up to date. If you determine that your dog or your vet determines that your dog has an anal gland issue, get those regularly expressed. We don't want them to get to the stage where they're causing abscesses because that can just be really, really nasty and causes a lot of pain. And in the end, if that does get really bad, like sometimes we do actually need to do surgery and remove the glands. But we try not to have to need this, to need to do that. So if you can get them regularly done now, it I can't give you a time for when, how often you need to get your dog's anal glands done. Every dog is different. Some dogs you might find it's every month. I've had a lot of clients whose um, dogs had to come and see me once a month and we do it and they it maintained it really well. Other times, you know, you might find that it's every six months, it might be every three months. Some dogs never get them done at all and they're fine. So you can't guess with this. It's just a little bit of trial and error. Get onto it as soon as you see them scooting though because you don't want them to um, develop into anything nasty. Right, with the skin folds, you wanna keep them nice and dry and clean. You need to look after them daily. It's a daily job. You own a pool dog of any sort or any other dog with skin folds, that's part of your job is to look after their skin folds. It's like us having a bath every day or a shower every day. Your bulldog's gonna have to have its folds cleaned every day. 
And then again, if your dog has allergies, well, then there are some wonderful medications available now. Days. I want to learn more about those we can definitely discuss that in an in-depth consult um, and we need to because there'll be things trying to work out what's actually the inciting cause because sometimes we don't need medications if we can find what the actual problem is righty ho let's see I've got some got a question here okay Rachel what's Rachel got here we have a new client who has their Cavoodle Express regularly and brings her for a wash immediately after. Are there any special cautions or treatments we should be considering? Thank you. Oh, okay. So, I mean, I guess the the only thing is, is that um, I'm not a fan of washing all the time. Like, um, you can actually destroy the good the good oils in the in when you when you're always washing so that's why the whole idea of doing um, local washes and that sort of thing is a much better idea so so if it's hey if it's a once once a month wash then that's not going to be a problem at all I'm more like talking about these people that often wash multiple times you know a week every even every, every once a week like it can be very drying on their skin um, you can actually buy, purchase like skin shampoos now. Um, I also really love any of the products that have got the, the, the Omega-3 products and the fish oil products. Definitely not um, flax, anything that's got fish oil. Um, I find the fish oil much better than the flax. And the Omega-3s are really, really good for skin and really good for these types of problems because of course, it helps um, with allergies and it can help, um, you know, prevent some of these problems happening. So, yeah, I hope that answers your question there. And Susie says, my boys scoot all the time and my vet cannot find anything wrong. Well, it's like, well, I always think there is something wrong with these dogs. I, um, there's always a reason for something. So. Ultimately, they'll have irritation there. Um, dogs don't generally scoot out of a habit, usually a reason. So if it's not the anal glands, maybe they have got, you know, they are itchy. And it could be an itch, like that's not causing enough to make you think, oh, they've got a nasty allergy. So it could be just um, a mild itch, and you know like it just it's just not that bad what you could try is using something like chlorhexidine wipes and or even just a flannel with just a wet flannel in fact and just wiping your dog's feet and bottom after they've come in from outside if they've been running around outside and, and then just seeing if you notice any differences because that is probably the reason why they're, they're doing that because they are just a little bit sensitive to maybe a grass or a weed or something like that. Look, I'm guessing here, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something like that. If there's no more questions, we will say goodnight for the night. Um, if you if you do want to talk to a vet about your particular dog and their individual problems as i said earlier we're always available 24 7. Um, the website's yourvetonline.com we're australia's only online vet that's available 24 7 for you so um, for 49.95 you've always got that access to a veterinarian and you don't ever have to guess or worry anymore so you have a wonderful evening and i'll see you next week for the next edition of hey doc thanks bye for now